Hey Art History, today we're going to do art from 1945 to the 1970s. Um, we're going to do this very fast because some of the stuff you've read in the summer reading we've really talked about a lot and some of those continuations of previous ideas. So I'm um, just kind of, um, I'll be a little bit more fast paced today. Uh, if you look at this map, uh, this is a post-World War II map. Um, there you might notice that there's kind of um, establishment of um, the Soviet Union, um, East and West Germany, that's how it was when I grew up. Um, and um, various states. There's also a leaving of um, Europe out of pulling out of um, the colonies that they had had. So there you have the Dutch East Indies down. These are going to break up in a bit. And then a lot of these African nations are actually going to be broken up into pieces um, through various independence movements. And um, you kind of have a, a new kind of, um, of uh, world happening. So uh, first on the list of artists post-World War II, we're going to look at uh, Giacometti. Giacometti was a Swiss artist. Um, his Italian last name is because his family uh, lived closer to the Italian border. Um, he moved to Paris. He is from a family of artists. His father was an artist, um, as well as um, all of his brothers. But Giacometti is the one that kind of stood out um, as the um, most um, significant one. He um, was classically trained and his original sculptures were very kind of traditional and in some ways didn't really stand out because they were very similar to a lot of other ones. But as it got closer and closer to World War II, as um, the war was going on, his figures started to shrink, um, particularly the heads, and then the, the bodies got thinner and thinner and elongated. And so he sort of created this very new uh, kind of human um, that looked kind of emaciated and, and whatnot, um, and it, it created a very different look of a sculpture. Giacometti also, um, you can see his fingerprints in all the sculpture. He kind of sculpts, um, he does not try and smooth things out. Um, and so his, his work is actually very easy to spot, is particularly the post-World War II, um, and was very influential of these humans kind of shrinking in space. He said, he said figures were never um, a compact mass, but like a transparent construction. It's a really good movie on him. He's kind of a kind of an interesting person. Uh, we also have Francis Bacon. Um, his stuff is kind of post World War II. Shows a lot of kind of atrocity, pain. Um, it, you can spot a Bacon because it really people are screaming and there's like meat and all sorts of interesting things. Um, one thing that you get distracted in a Francis Bacon painting, um, not really seeing all the bits and parts, but look at kind of his use of space here. He's definitely got, um, he's trying to create some sort of perspective space in his paintings um, and depth, but they're also kind of layered in flatness and there's a lack of shading. Um, he wants it to be figural, but he also wants it to be abstract. He wants it to be dreamlike, but he also wants it to be a nightmare. Um, Bacon's work's kind of um, very uh, thought provoking. Um, hard to sometimes look at, but thought provoking. Du Buffet um, is an abstract expressionist, um, and um, actually many of the paintings, um, Du Buffet's paintings are actually at, um, uh, there's some at the Phillips, there's some at the Tate, um, and these are actually kind of, he was painting around the same time in the 50s as Pollock, um, and they're a little bit different, but um, there's some, a lot of people talk about kind of their influences of each other. There is more figural representation in Du Buffet um, than Pollock, but there's also the same amount of like chaos and space um, that goes on. Pollock um, was um, kind of, he's sort of the star of the 1950s. Honestly, when I was younger, I, it was sort of like I had the Monet feeling about Pollock. Everybody loves Pollock. Um, Pollock, it, it, he brought in, he used, um, you know, canned paint instead of kind of these like tubes of acrylic. He uh, believed in kind of this um, showing the the remnant of the artist's um, uh, stroke by just kind of using these gestural drips and so you could kind of see where the artist had gone um, which is actually very similar to Giacometti's um, thumbprint all over his um, sculptures. Um, Pollock also was married to Lee Krasner who was an artist in herself. She was also an art critic and kind of heralded him um, but just realized that she actually got um, a lot of people now upon reflection look at his um, wife's work as well. He um, died young in a, in a drunk driving accident so oh, I mean not too young but like younger than he should have. Um, so um, his story kind of ends short but the very famous Lavender Mist is actually at the National Gallery of Art. We looked at it at the very beginning of the year um, and you can see that even though this is you know a lot of different colors and drips and it seems chaotic it, 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 
a lot of people say, well, a kid could do it. A kid cannot do this. The layers and the drips and kind of all of the various balance that's happening is quite extensive and very hard to repeat. Um, and uh, so that's Lavender Mist. Um, this is by Gorky, um, who was also painting um, in the 1950s. And this looks a little bit similar to kind of that surrealist automism that we looked at previously. This is Lee Krasner. This is um, Jackson Pollock's uh, wife. This is her stuff. And a lot of people are now looking at it in a new way. People thought it was derivative of Pollock, but actually, if you look at it, it's not derivative of Pollock at all. It's a very different kind of um, direction that she's going with her um, shapes and, and, and whatnot, her methods. But um, it has a very kind of um, very different look. Um, William de Kooning, there's a bunch of these uh, de Koonings at the Phillips as well. Um, this one was at MoMA. He did pictures of women. Um, and this is called, I think it's, I can't remember, it's Woman One. Um, and it's, um, people often say that um, de Kooning was painting his mother. Um, <laughs> now, um, there's, you know, a variety of things going on here, but um, he's abstracted the shape and it's all about the emotion of the this person, the body of them. Um, and even if they're going to kind of um, go abstract, we still have an understanding of, of, um, of that is a figure of a person. Um, Franz, Franz Klein, I tend to like his stuff. It's very kind of, um, it's abstract, um, but it's got a really good sense of balance in it. Um, and um, there's lots of layers. The longer you look at a Klein, the more you can kind of see that there's a depthness and different kind of layers where he kind of worked um, different areas um, in different ways and stuff like that. So, they, but most of his stuff is easy to spot because a lot of it's in black and white. This is Motherwell. Um, this is Elegy to the Spanish Republic. Um, there um, is a big Motherwell also at the National Gallery that you guys can see in person. It's a different one. But um, this is very similar to Klein. Kleins are small. So like the previous one you just saw is actually a little bit smaller. It's a six foot by eight foot. Um, whereas a Motherwell will take up, you know, like entire wall of the gallery. They're huge. Um, and um, they're sort of, um, they almost read to me as like giant maps um, or um, kind of giant um, murals. Uh, but in the, but instead of um, seeing specific things that we recognize, we're seeing it through his eyes um, of space. It's, they're kind of, they're very cool to look at for a long time. I'm going to pop through a couple of these. We saw Barnett Newman this summer, um, and he's a color field theory. He also does a lot of stuff with light, um, too. Rothko, you can go into the Rothko room, the Phillips. It's an amazing experience. I was going to take you guys this year, but you have to, only seven or eight kids can be in it at a time, and you sit in front of a Rothko, and Rothkos are kind of like the whole wall. Um, this is, uh, I think this is like six by eight feet or nine feet, and you you sit in front of it, and there's layers of color there, and the color is supposed to give you emotion and feeling, and Rothko wanted you to kind of um, it, to see if the, if the painting changed your feelings or you changed the painting when you looked at it for longer. It's, it's kind of a very interesting psychological experiment. Uh, this is Ellsworth Kelly, who used um, shapes he saw in the real natural world, and he'd take the big, big, take them down to the bare elements, and he would sort of highlight them in the bare elements. They're kind of cool. This is Helen Frankenhaller. Um, she um, was also an abstract expressionist. Um, this is called the Bay. She did this with acrylic. This is not watercolor. She thinned out the acrylics and had them sort of like drip, and she used different washes and stuff like that. Her stuff is really cool. But her stuff is based off of like a memory or an event. So like some of the link will be like out at night, da da da, da. and like it's a feeling she got from a moment um, when she was out, and you can kind of see it there uh we've got jasper johns three flags um he uh revisited this is 58 he looked a lot about what it was to be american he um has a lot of kind of uh changes in um disruptions to the american flag or um, somewhat patriotic but somewhat not too it's very interesting um Rauschenberg, he used a lot of like collage elements um and um found uh um, materials and sort of repurpose them they're very easy to spot because there's they're 3d usually but there's also like this like element of a lot of black and neutrals in his his works um and um so this is kind of um this is canyon um and it's kind of a really cool piece to kind of look at longer and longer and see what the elements going together um and so 
these kind of modern artists um, set this the tone for kind of going to full abstraction, which makes us then go and say, what's next in art? So I'm going to give you a part two um, in, a, in the next video.